Welcome everyone. Yeah. Welcome everyone. Uh, I hope I don't see myself, but I hope it works. Uh, my name is Magnus Melanda, and uh, I'm the co founder of Things, the Deep Tech Hub in Stockholm. I'm so happy that you can join us despite uh, the last few days before Christmas. Everybody who organizes events knows it's almost impossible to get anyone coming, except if you give them gifts. So we will give you a little gift today by a number of great presentations, a great entertainment and uh, an interesting hour or so with us. So we started things 2014 and the whole idea uh, was to learn together with large and small companies how to transform innovation in small companies into value creation in large. And our objective with things, which is a self-funded uh, company, uh, is, is really to enable sustainable business relationships between large and small companies, primarily in the industry where we are uh, active, which is industry infrastructure, utilities and mobility. So the, small, the whole idea was that the larger companies are losing control of their own domain, uh, regardless in which industry they are, I mean, because the technological development is so quick. So they are losing more or less control of their own domain rapidly. And they need the small innovation companies to keep track and get hold of what's going on. And on the same time, if you work with deep tech and the more difficult things that relates to the physical world, you just need the uh, larger companies to scale and accelerate because uh, it takes too long time if you, uh, let's say you have hardware involved or you are depending on hardware. So we think there's a magic little kind of relationship between the large and the small that we should be able to leverage together. So as of now, we have about 100 members of things. Half of them more or less are innovation companies. Uh, in those areas, and uh, the other half are established companies or say corporates. And our members, they, they, they are from Tokyo all the way to Silicon Valley, so we're quite international in, in, in reach. Uh, we are trying to get even more international, and uh, to our help, we try to find similar types of organizations in key markets for us. People who work and think like we are, and people who are funded not from government primarily. We want to have self-funded, more business-minded people to work with. And I was so happy when we met Gabriella and her team from Le Village in Milano quite recently. Uh, we had a good meeting and we found uh, out immediately that that's a very good example of somebody we would like to work with. And since we love to do things, but you know, hands-on, uh, we proposed to start to make a, uh, an event together. And that's what we're doing today. So uh, we, we also, I think we started slowly six years ago to learn how the actual meeting between the large and the small companies should best be arranged. And after a couple of years of practicing, uh, we, we got to know fairly well how to do that. At that point of time, we decided to spin out matchmaking from things. And that has become something called Ignite Sweden which is now an independent organization together with all the major incubators and accelerators in Sweden. And they do nothing more than arrange matchmakings between large and small companies. And they have fantastic numbers. They have arranged more than three and a half thousand events by now between one large and one small company. Very tailored, very high quality. And just a couple of weeks ago, they actually managed an international matchmaking with 10 countries 165 selected AI companies from those 10 countries and about 60 corporates. And they made 450 meetings in one day. And we were partners with that, of course, and we were managing Germany and Japan as relationships. And interesting enough for us, out of those AI companies, 17 were, from, were members of things and 11 of the corporates were members of things. So, so that was a very good kind of moment for us. So we normally, most of you who have been with us before have been in one of our eBazaar meetings. And those are then primarily to help corporate ready members to sell to companies abroad. We've done a lot of those. Uh, I think we've done 15 soon. This explore format that we do today is something a little bit different 
this is more focusing on on a trend or something that happens more generic than what are the e bazaars are the e bazaars on, on a specific market like e buildings or e industries or smart manufacturing and so forth this is more like more generic things that are important things like sustainability of course so we have decided to start to work with sustainability development goals and together with Gabriella and her team, we, did, we picked number nine as a good start. And of course, all of you know what number nine means. Industries, innovation, and infrastructure. And you know what SDGs are. They are 17, and they are a couple of years old, and every single UN member you come to have uh, signed up to those. So those are important. We wanted to make those a little bit more tangible by bringing in entrepreneurs who are active in those specific areas and who can help and share what they actually do and how they how it works, how far they have come, and more and more and most importantly, what they've learned. Because sharing what you've learned is the best way of making the whole thing work in the end of the day. So we have 52 guys signed up for today from six countries, which is great. And I hope you all will enjoy this a lot. So just finally, the way this will work, I will moderate this and uh, you all try to mute and close your videos because there are a lot of people who can create noise. After the event, you will get an email uh, with all the, the contact data and, and all the references to, to uh, what we have talked about and so on. So you don't have to make a lot of notes. You can contact people afterwards. Uh, after each uh, presentation, they will be short and energetic. Uh, there will hopefully be time for some interaction and you know, questions. And I would like you to use the chat uh, in Zoom to, to send questions to me during the speeches. And I try to make as many of them responded to. And if we have unresponded questions afterwards, we'll bring answers to them to the post mail that we sent out. Uh, I will introduce the speaker. They speak for eight minutes, maybe 10. And so there should be actually a couple of minutes for questions. We're going to stop in time. That's very important because we all know that you have to buy Christmas presents or whatever you have to do this afternoon. And we record the event, just you know. So on our YouTube channel, you can go back and look at the juicy parts if you like. And it's also good for the speakers to remember that what you say here doesn't stay here. You know, it goes everywhere. So I hope you sit comfortably now and are ready to be inspired because our first speaker is my new friend, Gabriela Scapiccio. She's the mayor or I'm called, it's called Sindaco, is that right? The yes. mayor of Le Village by Credit uh, called Milano. So welcome Gabriela, are you there? Thank you Magnus and good afternoon everybody. My name is Gabriela and I am the CEO of Le Village in Milan and welcome in our Innovation Hub. During my last uh, innovation expedition in the Nordic countries in uh, Sweden and Denmark, I met several innovative uh, realities and also things uh, with whom we decided to uh, collaborate and to have a partnership uh, to, to work together in the, in the future. So today it's a pleasure for me to present Le Village and some of our startups that are Sunixair, 3B and Hotbox that will tell you about their experience and how, how they push the, this goal of Agenda 2030 for sustainable development. Uh, what is Le Village? Credit Agricole decided in 2014 to open an innovation hub in Paris and uh, with, with, the, with the aim to innovate the group with the contamination of startups, but also to increase the innovation and the entrepreneurship in the, ter in the territory. Since then, uh, the group decided to open other villages all, all over Europe. Now we are a network of, of 37 villages. Uh, we have two villages in Italy and we are opening a, ter a third one in the Northeast next year. So we have now resident 800 uh, startups more than 600 partner corporate and uh, uh, 200 uh, startups uh, alumni. Uh, what, what we do, this is an innovation hub, it's an open ecosystem. We consider Le Village uh, as an open ecosystem that supports the growth of small startup and uh, scale up, innovative startup and scale up, but also accelerate company innovation. 
thanks to synergy and connection between large corporations, young companies, investors, and the international group of Credit Agricole. In December 28, we opened, we inaugurated Le Village in Milan. So we just did uh, our anniversary a few days ago. Uh, today we have 50 startup residents here and 14 partners, corporate. Le Village operates mainly on seven vertical topics that are some related to our excellence in Italy, like fashion, food, and uh, design, and some are uh, like fintech or future mobility or uh, pharma that are, yes, related to territory, but also to the group. But one that is the one of the main topic we develop here is, is the sustainability. So uh, we work cross all over the seven vertical topics with uh, helping uh, sus sustainable uh, startups and company or sustainable projects. Um, how we work with startups, we uh, support startups with, uh, with an ecosystem uh, that is uh, made by public and private small and big partners. We, we create a path of collective uh, and individual accom accompaniment uh, to the acceleration and uh, we uh, provide for our startups three main uh, activities. One is the pure acceleration. That means uh, we organize for them workshop training or uh, networking with, with, with big company and we help them with advisory and mentorship from external manager. External uh, means uh, manager of company in Italy. And then we do the second part of our uh, acceleration program is the fundraising. We have a demo day next, uh, next week here with 10 startups that are pitching in front of uh, around uh, 40, 50 investors. And then the last part is the internationalization program. So we provide, we help our startup to develop their business abroad, thanks to our village network in Europe, but also thanks to our, in our uh, investment bank hub that are all over the world, in the United States, in South America, in Japan, and, and all over the five continents. So this is what we do. I, I prefer to leave the stage to our uh, startups. And if you have any question, I, I am here. We can't hear you. Magnus. Sorry, I thank you, Gabriela. So uh, I, I, the way I, I foresee our collaboration coming forward is, is an ob obvious match that we have large companies are looking for talent far beyond our borders. And it will be helpful that we can go to you with, with, with look for it, you know, and the other way around, obviously. And also the, the, the smaller, the startups or the innovation companies, we can help them, you know, going in each of the directions. So I think this is a great opportunity for them. Thank you so much, Gabriela. And let's jump into our presenters. Do we have our first company, uh, Boriti here? Is Hans there? Hans, not the head? Yes, I am. Great. Where are you? Uh, I... But you're, uh, you seem to have blocked my video. Uh, I have not. Let's see. Um, let's... The host has blocked it, whoever is the host. <laughs> I am not the host, so it's Hans, no? There we go. There we go. Hi there. Hey Hans, good to see you. So uh, are you ready to share a screen? Yes, I am. Great, take it away. You see my screen, I hope? Yeah, no, not yet, but no. Oh, no, it's coming here. Here we go. Yes. So my name is Hans Nottehead. I'm the CTO and founder of a company called Varity. And uh, today I'll be happy to share some uh, findings and experiences from um, what we call self-service sales and delivery. So a, a way to make uh, or enable companies to sell services with, and products without human interaction. So we are a software as a service platform for uh, self-service payments and sales. So basically selling things without having uh, people present. Um, 
what we see is that the world is constantly changing. Uh, every decade and every year, some things change, and it's very evident that this year has <laughs> has been quite a lot of change with the COVID-19 situation. And this constant change is a challenge for companies in many ways, um, having to do heavy investments and trying uh, ways to make money and even to survive, uh, which is kind of difficult to do when the world is changing. So when we are talking to uh, companies and property owners, we are discussing a, a way to find new revenue streams by uh, transforming sites, things and buildings into uh, micro markets or ma marketplaces. And uh, I would like to share some examples of how this can be done. Uh, one example is if you look at the uh, buildings uh, have the traditional access control systems where you have some sort of card reader or something that shows a green lamp if you are um, allowed to enter the building. These are typically heavy upfront investments and they sit there for 10 years and do nothing more than let people into the building. But uh, our take on this is let's try and use this and transform this into a source of revenue instead of just being a cost. So how about we install a new type of self-service uh, point of service terminals next to the door that enables a total new uh, era of services and, and products. And one example of this is what we call the paid access. So basically giving customers access to your uh, sites and services even 24-7 uh, if you like. So we could open doors and barriers, gates, it could be, for example, introducing co-working. If you have a building, uh, the retail space uh, are being changed to some sort of co-working space. You can rent out uh, meeting rooms. You have public beaches and so forth where you would use public restrooms, uh, showers, sports events, car washes and so forth, where you pay to get access to the site and the services without human interaction. Another example is electric vehicle charging, where you, uh, when you charge your car, uh, typically have to bring a bunch of RFID tags or key cards with you in order to actually get the uh, power started in the EV charger. But uh, we see that this is a big hassle for the customers. So we favor open payment methods where you can uh, pay with uh, credit cards or your mobile phone in, in various ways. If it's easy to pay and if it's easy to have the EV charging started, then that will actually drive the transition towards a greener mobility and a, and a greener society. But EV charging is also a heavy investment in the chargers. So when talking to the charging operators and so forth, uh, same for property owners, trying to find ways to make more money by, for example, introducing uh, selling in vending machines, uh, coffee machines and so forth. While you're there charging and while you're in the building, you can even uh, have your customers uh, spend the time by buying more services and things. And even um, moving into resource sharing and the sharing economy, where you could actually, instead of buying, for example, tools and things, you can share and rent them um, by using our platform where basically anyone can start a sharing economy solution without having to develop any code themselves. Of course, using um, the e-commerce shopping trend with something called click and collect, where you buy the products online with your web shop and collect it in some sort of delivery box. But we favor open and neutral delivery boxes and Instead of you developing your own services, you can use uh, a ready-made platform. So all of this is enabled by um, our point of service terminals where you can uh, have the customer pay and buy your products and services without any uh, human or salespeople uh, present. You can use any open payment methods as well as uh, gift cards, vouchers, key tags, and so forth. And you can even select the features that you need for your specific site. For example, if you have a Italian payment methods that's specific for Italy or a loyalty scheme that's specific for a um, tourist hotel and so forth, you can select the modules and functions that you need for that 
specific situation. What we have seen here is that uh, obviously driven by the COVID-19, there is a huge demand for all types of uh, self-service sales where you can buy products and services without human interaction. The companies are struggling and uh, they are trying to find ways to actually make money in this situation. And with, with our solution, you can actually sell your, sell your services without having humans and sales staff present. Um, and as you saw by the examples here, you can actually find and create new revenue streams with quite little effort. Um, for example, start renting out co-working and meeting room spaces uh, to make some extra money if you have a property or a building that's uh, vacated for other reasons. Uh, of course, uh, we see that it could be a huge increase in sales by using these types of services by just going from cash to cashless or digital payments, or just by increasing the availability of your services from nine to five to 24 seven, uh, without even having uh, staff on the site available if you don't want to. And you can even uh, create new types of services um, that would drive new customers to your uh, products. So some of the learnings that we have seen here is Quite interesting is that <laughs> I might be sticking out my head here, but saying apps are dead. So, and in that sense, I say that at least single use apps uh, are dead. So, at here in the Nordics, people are very hesitant to downloading a new app that is uh, specific to one specific service. People don't have the time or the need to register for a new app to start using uh, services. So, the barrier to actually downloading and using a new app is quite high. So um, in our case, we favor uh, open payment methods that you have already existing, could be credit cards with Visa, MasterCard, uh, or various mobile type um, uh, of payment methods. These are services that the customer already have, but they will certainly not uh, download a new app just to get access to your specific single use type of uh, situation. Um, obviously, in addition to supporting SDG 9, as we do today, um, we are also supporting a few other sustainability development goals uh, with our platform. And um, these are very important to us uh, in order to provide services that can actually build companies and uh, make the world a little better. So I hope I have been on time, Magnus. Yes, you are. Perfect. Excellent, Hans. Let me tell you, do you, do you sell anything or do you have any business in Italy or anywhere else outside of Sweden or where are you commercially? We are commercially in Europe. Uh, we have started getting requests from Italy, so I foresee that next year we will be there as well. But okay. it's absolutely a pan-European service so far. Okay, great. Do we have any questions from the audience? Let's see in the chat. And uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, 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 uh. Okay, so, well, if that's the case, Hans, uh, we'll say bye-bye to you and thank you so much. And I will call for the next speaker. Thank you, Hans. Thank you. Uh, and don't forget to, exactly. Uh, so now our next speaker is uh, Anthony. Are you there, Anthony? Anthony? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Can you hear me? Super. Good to see you. I, I seem a little bit ghosty from the camera. <laughs> I don't know if it's no, no. It, the it, light. Yeah, well, it's light in your window. Here is dark. So there's a huge difference, actually. Yeah. So share your screen, uh, Anthony, and uh, take it away. And you know, we have a high expectation when it comes to food from Italy. So, you know, there's a lot of people. Exactly. You know. Okay, can you see it? Yes, perfect. Take it away. Okay, one second, let me just see. Okay, here. Now we are here. Great. So can you see? Okay, so hello everyone. Thank you for having me here. I hope uh, it's going to be an interesting presentation. So I'm here to talk about Hotbox. Now, the time is a little bit like kind of soon. So, but anyway, is it, we are getting to the, to the moment where you're kind of a little bit hungry in the afternoon so it's kind of relevant now 
look at this great pizza. Now imagine this pizza and picture yourself at home at night, you're kind of tired, you don't wanna do anything, no? And uh, at a certain point, you decide to place an order, no? And you place it and you wait for it impatiently. And finally, when it reaches you, this is what you get. Ah, uh, not exactly what you were waiting for, no? Like kind of a cold and soggy and not very nice looking pizza. And you know, like this kind of happened to me a lot of times, no? So, so I, I, I thought, okay, maybe I am unlucky. So I, I actually asked my friends and they told me the same story. And if you actually do a little bit of research on the internet, you can find a lot of people whose main complaint is cold and soggy deliveries. Uh, and this is not a problem only to us that we are the consumers. This is actually a, a problem to the restaurant owners. I would like you to meet Claudio. Claudio is a pizza, is a pizza owner, is a pizza maker in, in Modena, a city in Italy. Uh, his pizza place uh, does previous than COVID because now of course is almost 100% of his revenue in doing deliveries. And, and this is an increasing trend now because of course COVID has boosted the delivery of restaurants because restaurants at least in Italy are closed at the moment and they can only do deliveries. But it was an increasing trend also before and to do deliveries are actually expensive. No? So he, spends, he spent about 15% to do 50% of your revenues doing deliveries. No? So now he's probably spending around 25% because most of his revenue comes from doing deliveries. And yet 50% of these complaints he got was because his delicious pizza arrived at his customers cold and soggy. And even worse, some customers never call, never complain, but they never come back and they talk bad about his business. So I am Anthony, I am the CEO of Hotbox, and I am very proud to show you Hotbox. So what we did is that we developed a professional oven, a professional industrial oven that, that is portable, so you can mount it on different kinds of vehicles that will allow you to transport food from the restaurant to the people's tables, uh, keeping the quality of the food intact as it was supposed to be in the restaurant. It is built with best in class materials. So we have used uh, stainless steel inside, the same plastic of the bumpers of your cars outside. It has an, an insulation part uh, in the inside to keep the warm. Uh, and it has an active system thanks to a battery that allows it to be turned on for up to five hours at 85 degrees constant. And you can set it between 65 and 85. And this is a range because above 85, you keep cooking food and this is not our purpose. Our purpose is to maintain food constant uh, at the same quality as in the restaurant. Uh, below 65 degrees, you should not be allowed to do food delivery every, even though everybody is doing it because you're outside of the parameters of the HACCP rules for food hazards. And in fact, below 65 degrees, you have bacteria growth. Uh, and that, that's why also you shouldn't do it. Uh, but most importantly, it has an air circulation system inside that actually transports the steam that comes out from the food into a real and proper dehumidification, dehumidificator, I'm sorry, that will extract this steam uh, with droplets that goes outside. Uh, the, the end result is that you can eat for uh, even uh, farther than 40 to 50 minutes after you put the stuff inside the box, food as if you were in the restaurant. And because you can uh, transport food for more than 40 minutes, Hotbox became a technology enabler, meaning that with Hotbox, you can do multiple deliveries on a single trip because the quality of the last delivery is the same of the quality of the first delivery. And this is something that is not possible to do today because if you transport food on a normal, uh, on a normal thermal bag, like in the back of your head, of, of your back, like on the bicycle, it, like if you put two deliveries on a single trip, even if they are close to each other, already the first delivery is at suboptimal conditions, but the second delivery is definitely not eatable anymore. So thanks to this, we can say bye bye to hot, to, to cold and soggy pizza. No, we can we can welcome hot and crunchy or fragrant pizza at our doorstep. And because of the multi-stack delivery, we can optimize route uh, delivery routes and save money. So if we go back to Claudio, he'll have happier customers, of course. He'll get reviews based on his product and not on bad deliveries. And this is amazingly important 
like a study from Harvard uh, Business Review shows that one star, one star less on uh, on on your um, on your grading channels can mean up to 10% of revenue less. And with our experience, and because we have several clients, especially in Italy, we have realized that it is probably even more. So if you lose one star, you can even pretend to lose even more than 10% of your revenues. And because of multi-stack deliveries, he can actually save up to 3,000 euros per year, which is not bad because he can actually pay his hot boxes by doing it. So I talked about pizza because pizza is the most common food that is delivered almost all over the world, to be honest. But pizza is only one third of the food delivery market. Uh, there, is, there is a lot of other food, like, I don't know, French fries, hamburgers, pasta, uh, Chinese food, uh, fried chicken, uh, and whatever you can come in mind. And, and with COVID, also mid to high-end restaurants are actually starting to do some kind of, uh, of concept delivery uh, solutions. Uh, so we will see a lot of very interesting things that we can actually order at home uh, because of this COVID fueled uh, uh, the delivery business. And Hotbox is just great for all of them. It's especially powerful to steam uh, sensible food, like for example, everything that is fried or everything that has to do with dough or French fries, especially, and, and hamburgers. But it is also very good for pasta and uh, Chinese food and all of the such. Uh, we have a, we, we are actually a product as a service company, meaning that uh, basically uh, you don't buy our product, but you enter into a subscription based business model. Uh, you pay 250 euros as a as a deposit. Uh, and then we ship the hot box to you and you pay installments that starts from 59.90. This is also very cool because first of all, it allows us to increase the long-term value of the company because you have a lock-in effect on our, on our customers. And second of all, it makes us become, and this is very important to us, a circular economy company. Because when you have any problem on your hotbox, since the hotbox is not yours, what we do is that we retrieve the hotbox, we fix it, we give you another one in replacement, and then the one that we retrieve, we just put in the market to somebody else. So basically we, we, we can actually reutilize everything that we produce several times. We have two versions. One is mostly for mopeds. Let's say that somebody has mounted two of them on a car, but why? And, uh, or a cargo bicycles. The other one is a cargo version and is for, for, for cars. So, uh, today we are on the market. We hotbox. We have all. We have had court customers all around Italy. Uh, as you can see, here are some pictures of somebody that is using it, or some of our clients. Uh, this is our map of distribution of the hot boxes in Italy. Uh, we are more or less at 150 customers at the moment. Uh, but constantly increasing. And of course this year, even though it has been a tough year, personally speaking, because everybody is locked at home, from a, a, from a company perspective, it has been very nice. Uh, our goal is to start, and we have already started signing distribution partnerships in Spain, uh, Germany, Switzerland. Uh, we're talking to people in France and we're talking to people also in, uh, in Ireland. So we are, we are slowly starting to, to spread a hot box in Europe, but we are mostly working on Italy. So next year, we would like to go in Europe and maybe even abroad of Europe. The market is huge because just so you think in these selected areas, there is about 4 million restaurants. Now, because of COVID, let's say that 10 to 20% of those are going to probably shut down, but that means that the ones that are going to remain are going to be more specialized into, into delivery business, okay, and also they are going to be probably more flourishing, but nevertheless, 2.5% of this market for a hot box would represent a revenue opportunity of 108 million, so market is just uh, is not an issue our plan is to actually sell and distribute a, and rent 25000 units by the end of 2025 uh, we would like to have a basically 20% uh, sold and 80% rented 
course ranks is uh, also a interesting way of breaking entry barriers, you know, because you don't have to put up front so much money. You just have to put 59, 90 euros to use a professional device that is drastically increasing the, the way your food arrives at your customers. So that's very interesting. Also, yeah, I don't want to spend too much time here, but we to, to actually do this expansion, we are seeking to raise 2 million euros. So if you are maybe interested in investing in the future of food delivery, I am here. I can actually answer your questions. Uh, at the moment, Hotbox is kind of unique in the market because the rest of the solutions, I, we are the only solution that actually has a heating system plus a dehumidifier that works together to actually make food uh, uh, perfect at home, at people's home. There are some solutions that just transfer food. There are some solutions that are insulated. There are some solutions like, for example, red box that actually heats up the inside, but nobody is actually doing the dehumidification, which is super important because sogginess is what truly destroys the texture and consistency of the food. During the years, we have uh, participated to several events, one won some of them, got final, finalists to some other. Uh, we are a team of uh, four founders. Um, I actually was uh, developing drones at the National Space Institute uh, in Denmark in the, at DTU. Uh, Marco was working at Siemens as a project manager. Uh, Claudio, he's a mechanical engineer, but he actually worked uh, for uh, about 10 years as a pizza maker, during, as a pizza maker during, uh, during his studies. And uh, so he's the one that knows everything about food. And Domenico has, uh, was actually mounting a lot of industrial plants. And we have a growing work class team. So if I want to make like a last statement, we have a patented technology all over Europe and the patent has been granted actually. Uh, and we have also patented it in different zones in the world. We have strong industry partners, like to mention a few, Ascol, uh, which is one of the biggest um, biggest producer of scooters in in Europe, and uh, and Kultra, which is the biggest uh, uh, renting uh, long term renting solution in Europe. Uh, just to mention a few, and uh, we are an experienced team. We've been working at this for more than four years now, and we want to make millions of people happy to order food at home. Uh, so if you want to join us uh, at Hotbox, uh, we make sure you taste the food, not the journey. Thank you. Great, Anthony. Thank you so much. I have a question for you from someone here. It says, uh, do you include customer communication? I.e., when the end customer can expect delivery and things like that. So we are working at the, we, we have a recently released, uh, a, but to ourselves, so it's not in the market yet, an IoT board. So we basically develop our own uh, proprietary IoT board and we are developing the application. So at the end, what we want to do is to create an API that we can connect to some of our other partners that are producing, for example, delivery apps, okay, for restaurants and the such, so that we can actually provide uh, the graph of temperature even of uh, how the food was transferred from the restaurant to their home. Because I didn't talk here, and this is an interesting point uh, about the hot chain, because everybody is talking about the cold chain. No, it's important that the cold is maintained, but it is also important that the hot is maintained for the organolectic properties of food, for maintaining the consistency and the quality, but also to avoid bacteria growth. Yeah. Perfect. Very good. I have one final question for you. Do you think it works for meatballs? From? For Swedish meatballs. Is it okay? It takes care of those as well? Yeah, 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 it works. I mean, as soon as it's warm food, it works very well. The, the only thing that you need to do as a restaurant owner is that you need to actually um, find the right balance between the temperature that you set the hot box at between the 65 and these 85 degrees the amount of time in, in the recipe that you use and the amount of time that you cook it and the kind of packaging that you want to put the meatballs in. But okay. if, if you do a little bit of testing, you'll find the perfect setup to deliver perfect meatballs to your customers. It's a home run in Sweden. Thank you so much, Anthony. We have to move forward. So please unshare your screen and we sure. changed the order a little bit now, so I will have I will ask uh, Francesco 
Bye. Bye to everyone. Francesco, are you there? Can you jump in now? Francesco? Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Great. So, uh, so please uh, welcome and please share your screen. Uh, brilliant. Can you see uh, that? Yes, it's perfect. Take it away. Buongiorno. So, uh, hello, hello everybody. Um, uh, this is Sanixair. Sanixair is, um, is a company that was, uh, is a startup founded in Milano by a team of professionals. Uh, typically for this type of application, you would expect some young people, but it is not the case because uh, it happened that in 19, way before the COVID came up, uh, a team of professionals found very interesting to uh, tackle the problem of the um, uh, of the bad quality of in uh, of indoor air, uh, and uh, so typically uh, in uh, indoor we spend more than eighty percent of our time, and uh, uh, the, what is called the, the sick building syndrome is one of the aspects that uh, uh, do not um, uh, that make sure that you don't have a clean air and a clean environment around you so for these reasons the quality of air regulation is becoming more and more stringent and then with the covid it has been extremely important uh, also for uh, uh, for everybody to try to stay in a healthy environment uh, so uh, uh, the, the technology that we identified as most interesting for us is the photocatalysis. Why that? The photocatalysis has, uh, is uh, an existing technology since the 70s. Uh, it was already used in, uh, uh, in uh, for example, in the space shuttle uh, by NASA. Uh, to keep uh, to protect the environment of um, of the astronauts in uh, in the, in a very uh, in a very confined space. Uh, what is it about? Is with the, with the help of a catalyst and uh, and the UV and the UV light, uh, you can transform uh, um, the humidity of the air into uh, H2O2 basically and other uh, radicals which are uh, have very strong oxidating power the advantage of photocatalysis is that you will not be able to uh, to produce a, a quantity of h2o2 which is harmful for the health here we are uh, below one twentieth of the of the limit recommended by the world organization uh, of health and uh, these devices are extremely, so this principle we found is extremely interesting because the ability of these uh, byproducts of the photocatalysis to, to react with the organic compound, volatile organic compound, is incredibly efficient. Uh, and we have uh, a lot of tests or situations where you not only uh, we test in laboratory uh, to make sure that we find the right combination between catalyst and UV light, uh, but also uh, it attacks also, for example, the odors, the kitchen odors, or um, the volatile solvents, which, which are, uh, for example, in the resins uh, for the wood. Uh, so there are a lot of compounds that are uh, uh, tackled by this technology and make the air that you breathe much cleaner than that. Uh, we built, so our, what we did is uh, starting from the principle, we studied the combination in different combination and uh, we adjust the technology to different applications. So the first one that we did is what we call Airbox. Uh, it's, uh, it's a device that can be used uh, to clean a room the air in a room so you can keep it switched on for 24 hours a day or just by the time the people is inside inside of the of the room and uh, this goes up to 
between 90 and 150 square me, uh, cubic meters, which means up to a size of a room of approximately six by six. Um, um, what is interesting of this technology is that not only it tackles virus and bacteria, but also uh, formaldehyde, uh, it, it helps destroying the PM1 to 2.5 and 10. And uh, um, you can reduce also microparticles in the air, the smoke of the cigarette, for example. Uh, we have seen, we have done experiments where with only one box of this in, uh, in a small container where we put people smoking after 20 minutes, the, uh, you don't feel the, anymore the smell of the smoke. Uh, these are other devices that we built. One on top is a, is a series of, uh, that we call Haley. Uh, it's a, a sanitization project, uh, products integrated in, in a designer lamp. So this is a lamp that has uh, the feature of uh, uh, with the fan and the, and the photocatalytic, photocatalytic uh, devices to uh, clean the air uh, during the day in a design object. So it's, uh, and this is the first one that we did. The second one is the breath me is another technology that we uh, also, we understood it's can, it has a very good appeal uh, not for the coronavirus or or the or bacteria, but more in the um, protection of the uh, through the emission of negative ions, you have a, a, an important protection to the your uh, breath system, and um, and the quality of the air. Uh, for example, uh, it helps a lot against allergy. We have many people that uh, tried this device for allergy and they found incredible benefits very shortly. Uh, one of the most interesting studies we made is uh, how to clean the air in a car. And uh, the first project we made uh, was with a car sharing company. And uh, uh, we, uh, as you see, uh, we put, um, we created a small device in aluminum that can be put simply under under the chair of the passenger, and uh, can be plugged in also in uh, in in the simple in the electrical twelve or twenty four volt uh, feeder. Uh, still, you, uh, there is also a fan, a small fan inside, and we have made a lot of tests of this uh, because the the car sharing company. Uh, was really uh, interested in having very fast results uh, when it was time to move the, the rental from one passenger to another. And uh, we have made tests on, the, on several uh, surfaces of the car. Uh, and uh, we have seen that this has been incredibly efficient. So you see the big blue bars is uh, the situation before. And uh, where there is the yellow arrow is the, the result after 60 minutes. But you see already after 10 minutes, which was the main requirement of the car sharing company, you can get extremely good performance uh, in most of the parts of the car. Uh, around this, uh, we, we also produced other different devices besides the Haley, the Airbox and the Breath Me, Breath Me which is the one which is a wearable device. We have also designed uh, what we call GAP, which is GAP is, is a device that you can put in the main uh, HVAC systems in, in a building. So you can sanitize the air before it, it's in, uh, before inlet into the environment. And so giving um, a strong, help to the to the quality of the air within uh, within the building uh, you have to imagine that this technology was firstly tested against uh, a broad variety of bacteria because for example in italy uh, but not only in italy legionella is one of the most important diseases which drag the attention of the operators and um, why that? Because uh, Legionella is really deadly. So it's difficult to, to get, but when you get one, uh, you can die one chance out of eight. And so it's, uh, it's really something very serious. 
that it was at the, at the stake of the attention of all the operators until, until the beginning of this year. But we are sure it will be back because this is really what happens in the, in the air conditioning systems. Uh, we have received some, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, subscribed, so we have uh, filed for some patents. We have filed for four patents. We, have been, we receive already several awards in Italy. Uh, we have been receiving, so our projects of a variety of, uh, of devices have been really appreciated. And uh, we received uh, uh, subsidies and, uh, and uh, awards for, for our technology. And uh, uh, we keep designing applications. So our idea today is behind what you have seen. Uh, we aim to, to design, to introduce to the market another unit, another device, another product every three months. Uh, because what we see here is the, the value of, the, of what we did is the variety of application we are able to, to support. Uh, of course, cannot miss the idea of IoT. Uh, so we made a partnership with Microsoft. Uh, they develop a microprocessor, which is uh, the famous Azure Sphere. And um, we, embedded, we are embedding this into our uh, smart system uh, that can be controlled by remote. Uh, also because in many, uh, you have to imagine that in many situations, uh, if you have to do an hotel, for example, you need to be able to control what's working, what's not working in the different rooms. And so it's very important that uh, you are able to provide uh, uh, information in real time to, to the manager of, uh, of, the, of the building. Uh, why we selected Microsoft Azure is because data protection is at a stake. And um, uh, we have been convinced by the fact that this is the best uh, technology available today for data protection. Uh, you have to imagine that given the fact that there is a COVID uh, sensitive information name associated to, to context or to, to the rooms, etc. So it's very important that we keep the information, uh, the information safe. These are some of our technology partners and uh, some scientific partners. Scientific partners are all the companies that helped us in developing uh, the microbiological tests to make sure that the devices that we are using are, are, uh, are performing efficiently. So I took the liberty to make it quick. So if you have any Q&A, any Q, I can give you an A. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much, Francesco. That's great. Really interesting and very timely when, it, you know, when we talk about COVID and everything, everybody's into this area now. There is a question for you specifically. Who is your typical customer? Uh, uh, it was, yeah, hold on. It, is this mainly for homes or offices, public spaces? And would this protect against spread of COVID, obviously? Okay. Uh, Allora, uh, two things that I have to say in, to this question. The first one, we have already 11 different applications in uh, malls, shopping malls, hotels, restaurants, also famous restaurants or famous uh, hotel. Uh, we have been awarded of a couple of projects at the Hilton. Uh, we have been awarded by Cannavacciuolo, which is a famous chef in Italy. Uh, and uh, we have uh, really several applications that makes us happy. Uh, about tests on COVID, uh, you cannot do a real test straight on the COVID because nobody gives you the COVID available, no? because it's very dangerous. But what we did is uh, there are, uh, in microbiology, there are different type of coronaviruses that you can use which are less harmful. Or for example, you use viruses like adenovirus which is uh, way more resistant to UV than it is the COVID. And so you, you try to extrapolate the performance through t tests on different, different micro germs. I, ha I have another question for you. So yes. do you provide the end customers with any sort of reports telling them how much better the air is after install your product rather than just having to assume it's better? No, what we do in, in most of our applications, in most of our customers, 
uh, we recommend the customer to do a test before a test after. So we enter into the room. Uh, we in the last installation that we made in uh, in a large facility in Roma, uh, we made 240 tests. So uh, which are swabs, swabs on the tables, on the lamps, on uh, uh, and we made before and after. And then we make the comparison before and after to make sure that the customer is convinced about the performance. Yeah, yeah. perfect. I think we, uh, no, there is one more question here. Please. Have there been any independent tests that confirm the results that you present when it comes to eliminating viruses and bacteria and is tested against SARS-CoV-2? -CoV so all the tests that we do are not done by us, but by independent laboratories, certified and accredited. So we don't do, uh, so you cannot claim you are good, no, <laughs> basically. So you need someone else to assess that. And so this is why all the technology partners that I've shown uh, are the laboratories that are accredited, are, are serious companies and uh, uh, are the ones that are better equipped to do the test quickly also because sometimes you, you, you need speed also. Francesco, time is running out. I'm sure you will be contacted afterwards because there have been a lot Pleasure. of interest in this area. And thank you so much for your, for your presentation. Great. And don't forget to unshare your screen, please, because we have a new speaker coming up. Is uh, Pau, are you ready now? Uh, is it still shared? No, it's not. You're right. Okay. So You're right. I'm okay. Yeah, you are. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, Paul. Hi. Uh, Hi Paul. Here we go. Yeah. Are you ready now? Yes, absolutely. Thanks. Um, thanks everyone for attending. I hope you will enjoy um, the presentation. Share your screen. So, yes. Is it fine? Yes, but you, uh, you have to presentation mode as well. Yes. Here we go. Perfect. Yes. Take nice. it away. So our company, uh, I'm Paul Malo, Malol, the CEO um, of Inconova. Our company has been focusing for several years on developing uh, robotics, uh, more particularly drones for underground and tunnels, underground mining and tunnels, um, uh, laser scanning, um, drones, aerial solutions, more particularly can, uh, can access areas where uh, not only line of sight, but video line of sight, areas where um, <laughs> Um, no people can get in, or the traditional methods give suboptimal results or partial results in the laser scanning, for example. So I'm gonna. This will have direct. Um, uh, this type of technologies have a direct impact. Sorry. Okay. Sentinel. Yeah. Perfect. So um, perfect. Yeah. This, this uh, type of technologies uh, have a direct impact impact in uh, optimizing, uh, in, in this case, for example, underground uh, operations in mining and other also other bifurca bifurcated uh, use cases and markets. But let's focus on, on, on this uh, for now. Um, and it's a cost efficient uh, way of gathering information, complete information, which is actually one of the keywords as well. Uh, because you can get really into areas where other sensors or methods cannot uh, achieve. Uh, access. So aerial surveys in general, in any case, are uh, usually safer. Uh, you can get farther and closer to areas of interest and uh, faster. Uh, particularly uh, in these cases, we don't need uh, uh, this type of technologies do not need the infrastructure, existing infrastructure. Um, all the communications happen between the, the drone and the operator or ground station. But if there is Wi-Fi or 5G in the, uh, in the areas uh, um, where the operator usually stays, the data can also be transmitted to control places. It can be integrated more seamlessly, seamlessly in, uh, in uh, mining systems. Um, so this type of uh, technologies can save a lot of time, uh, uh, resources, and money. Uh, obviously, um, for reducing the number of people needed, for achieving the same amount of data from a certain area, uh, able to relocate or repurpose uh, certain human resources to more value uh, tasks. 
Uh, it allows also to get close, as I mentioned, to areas where uh, are not safe to get there. Here you can see, for example, the bottom of, a, of an ore pass, uh, which is basically a, a shaft where it's used for transport the material, either the ore that is extracted at higher levels or waste material, uh, stones and so on that are not valuable from the ore perspective. Uh, and you can imagine that it's not very safe to get closer to that place. Uh, these areas, anytime, even not dropping anything, any piece of stone or anything can fall uh, over there. You can see a lot of stone from the bottom. So drones, aerial solutions allow to safely uh, place the operator far from the danger zones. This is an example, for example, of uh, uh, that we actually performed very, very particular, very exciting place. This is this inclination that you see here in the right picture. That's actually we did we did not incline this picture. That's how this type of ore body has been mined. Follow ore body, it gets this type of uh, shapes and these inclinations. You can imagine uh, how dangerous it is to get there. Uh, this is an old mine uh, and drone technology to assess old mine workings to see if with new technology can be reopened certain areas and extract more ore with the technology that nowadays exists. Because these mines are 50, 60, 70 years old. On the left side, you can see the same area, but from the real time visualization that, that our particular system has, for example. So we fly bio line of sight. Sorry. Let's see if I can. Oh. Traditional methods uh, can be, uh, for example, the same laser uh, scanner uh, on, a, on, on the tip of a pole or a, or a train, and then you put it as inside as possible and you map what you can, right? So you can see in this picture, uh, and this is very common, that there are blind spots. Also, the farther the, the laser, the, the farther the areas are, the the laser beams are more separated, so you get less resolution in the point cloud that you get. So with drones, as shown in the bottom picture, you can see that uh, we one can actually bring the scanner wherever um, other methods are not suitable for, and get a map of the of the area. On the right hand side, you can see um, to the model of the same models of the same picture of the same area, uh, one with the traditional method, and below after flying a drone there. <clears throat> More particularly, a very, a very interesting case and, and, um, is our ore passes. As I mentioned before, ore passes or waste passes are shafts from two to three meters to five traditionally diameter, and they can have 100, 200 meter uh, length, very, very, very long. Uh, in many cases. These are passes, uh, they are inclinated at high angle, 70, 80 degrees, and these are actually a very cost efficient way of transporting uh, ore. So in every level, as you can see in the, in the scheme on the left, you can see the pink and the blue um, um, uh, sketches or areas. These are the drivable uh, areas where machines are extracting material. And then they go to the green, the green, uh, sections in the picture and they dump the material to the bottom levels and then from the bottom levels the old ore pass is extracted outside the mine so um, that saves a lot of fuel that saves a lot of time it is a big help here so ore passes are the heart of the of the any underground mine operation uh, and you have to make them to con to uh, maintain them properly um, the problem with ore passes is that, as you can expect, uh, throwing tons and tons of ore and stones and so on over time, the walls get damaged, they get pockets and so on. So this is very, this can or even get blocked uh, if there are collapses. So that's not only safe, safe issue, safety issue, but also can cost millions of uh, millions uh, uh, of uh, dollar per month loss. Uh, if there is a single or pass blocked at some point or so aerial technologies uh, can actually help 
mitigating these this, uh, this, uh, pains by scanning regularly these areas and either um, predict, even predict at some point when these ore passes can be actually need to be maintained. Instead of being proactive with the aerial solutions, one can be, uh, sorry, instead of being reactive, when there's a problem, you fix it, you can be proactive and fix it in the right time, not way before, but not when the problem happens. Uh, there are many other applications of uh, uh, aerial solutions and, and uh, also uh, operations underground, like infrastructure and other assets underground, uh, mapping and uh, as built uh, scanning. All mud is a particular case where we are actually pretty pretty interested and we are we have been actually applying in different of these scenarios where areas are very tight, um, very dangerous. You can see on the bottom right uh, uh, a mine in Turkey here where we were actually uh, uh, um, flying our systems, how tight are there. Um, so it's a safety, it's a safety uh, reason that uh, um, laser scanning has to be completed and, and drones can help on that, but also economical and, and environmental. Um, you can optimize your, your uh, operations uh, in many aspects. Other applications uh, related to uh, reduce suffering and, and, and helping save, saving lives literally is to use aerial solutions when there are incidents. Um, unfortunately, there are still incidents underground in caves and uh, tunnels and mining as well. So um, you can, one can actually use uh, idle solutions for that, for assess, to, to bring the drones and assess how, what's going on in areas where are dangerous to get in and see if there is people or something. And, and then there are other, other, other applications uh, um, that I'm not gonna go in detail. Any, any uh, questions can be asked after this presentation or contact me, uh, obviously. But underground um, in general, and um, in inaccessible areas, particularly in dangerous areas, uh, the, the bottom line is that aerial solutions are extremely useful, very uh, cost efficient, um, and can actually um, can actually help at many levels. So thank you very much. I think I got some extra time for questions. I hope. Yes, you have. Great, uh, otherwise... great, Paul. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. do we, I don't have actually, I don't have any questions on the chat, but they have a lot of comments, how cool this is and how fantastic and so forth. So I'm, I know there are some people who are really impressed on what you say, uh, Pau. So uh, tell me, and maybe you touched on that. I think that you can use the same kind of equipment and, and methods in other areas, uh, under uh, that are kind of dark and, and dangerous, like whatever tunnels or is, is that right? Absolutely. So that's that's the that's the key point of uh, uh, our particular technology uh, is that we we don't rely on on cameras on the drone where that they, they give you this field of view you don't see what is on the sides. Uh, uh, unfortunately, there is no time, but we have very interesting videos in our YouTube channel, uh, LinkedIn, and so on, which describe and show very well what we do. But as you said. Uh, the, what we do is we, we uh, the 3D laser data that we are getting already for the mapping that the client wants, we use it in real time to actually uh, uh, fly uh, from the operator. The operator has a screen, a uh, touch screen, and it can zoom in, zoom out, and rotate around the, the drone model that you see. Um, and the awareness is, in, is in not, not to mention we have collision avoidance and all this fancy stuff, uh, but the real-time visualization of the 3D data, it can fly anywhere. Um, doesn't matter. There is no light need, needed, nothing. Yeah. Brilliant. So, and I say, if I remember correctly, uh, you have been flying your drones basically in all continents by now, so. And I'm missing Antarctica and, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yes, otherwise, uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, now the yes, sure. except Antarctica. Great. Mostly. You have to stop there, Pau. Thank you so yeah. much. And uh, people will obviously contact you, I'm sure, because I see all those chats that I get. <laughs> so, so thank yeah. you so much, Pau. And let's go forward to uh, Nick. Are you there, Nick? Nick, calling on Nick Emily.
Yep. Yes, here we go. Yeah, hi. hi. Yeah, I'm here, Sore. Welcome, I'm starting my yeah thank you very much so uh i'll 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 continue the topic with uh geological uh things which paul just uh present us but uh, uh and just give me a second and here is my presentation Perfect. so is it is it on your screen yeah good Perfect. good good right. yeah good right. yeah so uh, this is this is as I said about the uh, geology about this earth, uh, but I'm going to talk uh, not uh, about onshore things, but things which is uh, going uh, on a deep ocean, so somewhere in the middle of um, world uh, world ocean. So uh, fluid size basically, so it's uh, technology. Uh, to acquire data uh, and uh, recover the structure of uh, subsurface of the of the of the ocean. So, uh, so our companies had a pretty pretty big experience under our belt. Uh, we primarily do the research exploration for different con con companies for different uh, countries uh, and uh, gather uh, experience and understanding what the limitation, physical limitation, practical operational limitations of existing technologies and experience of marine exploration. Uh, so a few years ago, we decided uh, to kind of consolidate our uh, understanding and uh, develop our own technology and uh, equipment to do their uh, data acquisition uh, as, uh, at the as marine, marine data acquisition. So uh, we put, I could say, three key uh, requirements to new technology. First one is to make it cost-effective. Uh, to be uh, competitive uh, with a uh, conventional one. Second thing is uh, to make it as low carbon footprint as it's possible for, for, for that uh, uh, type of activity. And uh, third thing is to uh, minimize involvement to, uh, of uh, people in uh, so open sea or uh, so uh, water to, to to minimize uh, to minimize risk of uh, any as uh, let's say it's incidents and fatalities so this is three things which we put into there uh into the system so uh it's 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 quite specific things so i briefly illustrate so why do we need uh the data from from that far i could say where no one basically uh leaves so uh, there is uh, several applications of that type of data, so seismic and acoustic data. So first one, it's uh, geohazards. So we know that uh, tsunami uh, appears uh, and uh, it's caused by earthquakes, underwater earthquakes. So uh, seismic waves or seismic signals, it's uh, it's kind of uh, signals which uh, illustrates uh, was, um, illustrates their earthquakes uh, epicenter and uh, used to predict tsunamis. So we need to observe the large areas to to be as uh, alerted. So it's uh, natural resource and uh, resource exploration offshore. We know oil and gas, but there is uh, others. Uh, um, uh, metals uh, so on the sea floor, uh, the sea surface, and uh, and so on. So basically, seismic data uh, for offshore exploration is the core uh, uh, information source of information to estimate and assess uh, for perspective. So uh, companies who do uh, explore uh, exploring for oil and gas, they. Uh, assess perspective before they invest uh, basically hundreds of million dollars towards uh, to the area and the only uh, input is seismic 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 data seismic information shows them what is uh, 
uh, earth structure on the on the sea, sea surface. So it's it's uh, have an uh, ecological application. It's uh, underwater noise pollution. So it's things which not directly connected to the to us as a human, as we never uh, hear. Uh, what is going on underwater, but uh, this type of pollution uh, heavily affects all, to all um, marine marine uh, animals because this is the uh, way of communication for them and any strong noise, te uh, uh, technogenous noise uh, really disturb their uh, feeding ha habits, or uh, reproduction habits and uh, force them to uh, to leave areas or we pro we in unintentionally produce a lot of underwater noise by uh, construction by uh, uh, ship traffic or uh, some uh, radars and all the things or so uh, uh, controlling acoustic and seismic data is a way to see how much uh, artificial uh, sir, sound exposure we produce in, in the area. So uh, defense, uh, uh, I'm not talking about this military stuff. I'm basically talking about uh, control uh, some areas of uh, unmarked uh, surface uh, uh, traffic or subsurface uh, traffic. It could be some smugglers and uh, some or uh, bo uh, illegal boats, or it could be uh, uh, debris or uh, another big application of uh, such things is, um, uh, let's call it uh, uh, in uh, irregulated fishing activity, especially in uh, third uh, in, in Africa, in India. So where there are uh, thousands of small fishing boats, um, have no uh, radius uh, uh, marks, IS, uh, IS indicators, and it could come in collision with any operations or, of, or traffic of big vessels. Or this is uh, seismic and acoustic is a way to mark them and control their their locations. Or and uh, any any engineering application underwater is. Um, basically construction uh, piles for bridges, uh, underwater cables, I mean, uh, intercontinental cables. So all of this requires uh, understanding of uh, subsurface structure to be sure that there is no faults, there is no gas seeps or any, any uh, features which, which could uh, destruct or basically uh, collapse the, 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 the structures, uh, I mean, techni uh, technogenical structures afterwards. So uh, it's, it's really quite a lot of things which requires uh, that type of uh, on the, uh, measurements, that, uh, that type of data. So definitely, definitely, there is there is uh, plenty of technologies to do this research, and uh, it's uh, uh, now it's done by uh, big vessels, uh, uh, quite often by by several vessels, uh, and basically to bring the simple sensors, it it requires 50, 70 uh, people uh, crew for a few months to be offshore, uh, to do uh, a lot of uh, operations uh, on board, uh, to deploy and recover us. Uh, so it's uh, the, 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 the normal uh, equipment, set of equipment costs um, 30, 50 million dollars. So, and it's, uh, consists of a uh, huge amount of sensors which is towed by one vessel or a few vessels to to, to scan the, uh, the the area so just just to illustrate uh it's it's uh, high fuel consumption for si such uh, uh surveying uh it could be up to a hundred tons per day of uh, marine fuel just to do the exploration and normal projects there. 
uh, duration is uh, several months. So um, uh, this is how it looks like for today. And our idea is to use the uh, modern technologies to minimize it and make it uh, autonomous. Uh, and at the same time to reduce uh, the uh, uh, so exposure to, uh, to, 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 uh, to marine life and uh, emissions, CO2, CO2 emissions. So we see that uh, the, the, we, we, put the, we put the core that this is an autonomous system which able to do uh, the terrain with the minimum involvement of uh, people. So it consists uh, uh, four segments. It's uh, the uh, autonomous nodes for data recording to to be able to send to uh, sense the, the information. So it's uh, drones to support each nodes uh, to refill it. Uh, uh, fourth, it's uh, third. It's uh, a small autonomous vessel to deploy and to recover and or, or, uh, or when you need any manipulation. And then it's integrated pilot and acquisition system to control and manipulate all these uh, elements. So basically it's look like that. So uh, instead of uh, having uh, uh, a lot of passive elements and control it and manipulate it by people and uh, big boats. So uh, we going to use uh, independent uh, small notes, uh, record the same, the same information uh, and uh, support units, as I said, as a drone, which will uh, uh, deliver fuel or and recharge its, its, its unit and uh, the boat uh, to, or to, to, um, to, to, manipu to manipulate with the uh, with uh, with uh, recording notes, so uh, so we we left two people the the only plan the survey to control us uh, the data quality and execution so that the, the rest is uh, on uh, autonomous system. So we start from very basic. We start from core function is. Uh, we try to record uh, the same data, the same information, but using the surface, uh, so surface located voice. Uh, it, it was three years ago, and we produced the set of this equipment and uh, do start from pilot survey and then as uh, commercial projects. We find out that uh, it give us uh, flexibility and at the same time that's very good quality of uh, of the data so it was kind of first uh, milestone we successfully pa passed but uh, we faced that uh, that uh, just free floating units uh, have a strong have a strong limitation because we could not control where we uh, do the measurements and we could see its location, but never uh, manipulate. So we could deploy and recover. Uh, Nick? Uh, sorry, or, Nick. Yeah. Nick, sorry. You have only yeah. 30 seconds left, just so you know. You have to stay in time. 30 seconds left. Oh, ah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So, so basically, so then we, then we move to our active, our, uh, active uh, system. Uh, so you could see it uh, start relocates itself. So I, I skip those things. So core, core, of, um, core that we switch to hydrogen as a, as, a, as a fuel because energy density is much higher with the hydrogen. And uh, another benefit for us is instead of recharging battery uh, for the days, uh, hydrogen is refueled in 30 seconds. Uh, so, and uh, we uh, compare with efficiency uh, and it shows really good uh, cost to value benefits above others uh, other methods uh, of data acquisition so uh, it's not just as uh, technical or ecological benefits it's purely commercial so uh, on that stage we are uh, uh, invite uh, early clients uh, 
uh, oil companies or exploration companies, and at the same time, uh, technical partners uh, to join the, 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 the project. Yeah, thanks. That's, that's it. Great. Thank you, Ney. I'm sorry that to, to rush you, because this is very interesting. And there are a lot of people who will contact you afterwards. I see that in the chat. So thank you so much. Uh, we don't have time for any questions now. We have to jump to our last speaker. And I, I unfortunately will be a couple of minutes late. So I hope you can excuse us for that. So our next speaker is uh, Nico. Where are we? It's, uh, yeah, it's Nicolo. Nicolo. Hi, hi, nice to meet you. Hi, hi. hi. Good to see you. Thank you. So I'm sharing my screen. Hope no, you see. In, oh, there we go. Perfect. And and do it in presentation mode, please. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, um, everybody. I'm excited to be here. Um, I am Nicolo Calandri, CEO of 3B. Um, and today we are speaking about uh, biodiversity. Uh, mainly about pollination. So we are talking about uh, number two of uh, SDGs, so no anger. Um, I won't start with a number. I, I'm also try to be in time because uh, we, I know that we are in late. Um, and I will start with a number, 80%. 80% is the importance of the bees in the food supply chain. Um, Bees pollinate the 80% of all the crops, vegetables, all around the world. Not only in Italy, not only in Europe, I'm talking about all the world. Bees are the main pollinators. There is also a number that always uh, remember the, the problem of the bees and is the 30%. Last year, we lose the 30% of the bees uh, in Europe. So 30% of the hive, 30% of the beehive, 30% of the bees. We are talking about million, billion of bees. And uh, of course, we reduce the honey production, but we are not talking about honey. Honey is not the problem. Honey is not the, the key point here. We're talking about uh, biodiversity. We are losing crops yield. Without bees, and due to this problem, we are losing the 60% now, not tomorrow, now, we are losing the 60% of the crop yield. Farmers are facing this problem and are trying to pollinate using drones, using other people instead of bees, like, Epin, like China Tishas. Um, but this is not a sustainable future. That's why 3B was born. We merge uh, electronics and biology. I have a PhD in electronics and Ricardo, um, the co-founder of 3B, has a PhD in biology and also is a strong professional beekeeper. So what we do is uh, that we, we merge electronics, my skill, and the ability of Ricardo in understand the sound of the bees. We provide uh, an electronic device, this is a tiny chip that is able to communicate with bees. It's a very small device. It can be installed in any possible hive, beehive all over the world. It, 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 it is able to collect different biomarker from humidity, temperature, and sound. And thanks to this biomarker, we send this on the cloud, this is an IoT device. We use uh, some machine learning algorithms, just to be fair, very simple and basic uh, machine learning algorithms for a PhD, uh, for a PhD student. And thanks to these uh, algorithms, we are able to provide a service to the beekeeper, a decision support service. That is our secret sauce, let's say. We are able to, thanks to this service, to increase to decrease the mortality rate, we already demonstrated decreasing down to the 20%, decrease the chemical compound in order to provide an ethical agriculture, in this case, an ethical beekeepers, beekeeping. We also are able to decrease the operation cost. Beekeepers are far away in the field. They use helicopters in Italy to move, for example. Yes, it's true. They fly with helicopters, with bees on the helicopters. Imagine that. Um, and um, 
thanks to our device, it's possible to reduce these, uh, these operation costs down to the 60%. Overall, we are able to increase the productivity. But mainly, the key point, and I want to stress out, we are able to increase the production of honey. And as I explained, it's not a matter of honey. The honey is the result of the biodiversity. So we are increasing the biodiversity production. Um, last year, we installed, in the last two years, sorry, we installed more than 2,000 devices, more or less, mainly in Italy, as you can see, but we are spreading all over the world. We start also a social, a social study in, um, in Africa. Italian beekeepers are teaching African beekeepers with our technology, using uh, this remote working technology, so they understand the bees in Africa and try to uh, teach the, the operation. Uh, thanks to our 2,000 device, we increase the crops yield, so the crops production up to the 30%. And uh, this is a, a marketing opportunity. Of course, we are increasing the biodiversity, but also we are creating a new, uh, we are creating a new market, um, the market of the pollination. Next year, the 2021, will be the first year when we release the first trading application for pollination. The name is Pollinator. We want to release a trading platform. In one end, you have beekeepers and bees. In the other, you have the farmers. And we match the needs of the farmers with the ability of the beekeeper to pollinate. Uh, we ask one chant for every, bee, every bees that we save and we provide to the farmers. In this, in this industry, we are the only one right now, except for uh, the monopoly of Bayer and Corteva. So we start, we want to democratize the pollination sector, trying to destroy the monopoly of Bayer and Corteva. Quite easy, simple to say. Um, let's conclude. Our goal in the next, uh, in the next five years, in relation to the Green Deal, let's talk about uh, KPI now, is to increase the economical value for the beekeeper, we are talking about uh, 6,000 euro per beekeeper per year, increasing the pollinators, so the pollination efficiency, so the biodiversity, increasing the fruit and vegetable production thanks to our superpower bees, up to two, 2 million tons of production, increase the economical value for farmers. We want to improve the value chain from the bees to the farmers. Of course, we start in two people. Now we, are, we have a team of 15. Alone is almost impossible to, to accomplish, uh, accomplish this mission. Um, and uh, summarizing, what we are looking, what we are trying to do is to let the bees pollinate. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nicolo. Uh, let's say I have a question for you before. Uh, I understand that farmers will benefit due to better or more crops, but should this be government funded? It affects us all. Shouldn't this be government funded? It affects us all. Do you get any fund from government or is this primarily privately paid? Uh, we have also European funding. That's, that's a good point. For sure, we start from uh, this European funding, but the sustainability for us is the market. So we are trying to, we are already in Brakeven, and the Brakeven comes from uh, from customer. And the customer now are the beekeeper. Tomorrow will be also the farmers. Perfect. Now I happen to believe that all companies are going to change the world or save the world. Will have to be business oriented. So otherwise, you work against the wind, so to speak. I think this is fantastic, and I think this is a very very good end of this nice little session we have together. Uh, Gabriella, are you there still? Or have you left us? I am here, sorry. Okay, great, super. I, I just wanted to ask you if you agree with me that this was a very good uh, yes, very blend good. of companies from Italy and Sweden. And, yes, very uh, good. And different kind of companies, from drones to bees <laughs> and mines. Yeah. Yes. And I know you are similar to me because this is what makes me you know, smile when I go up every morning and have to work with those wonderful entrepreneurs. I think most of most of the thing that will happen to, to to help us to save the planet is really very good entrepreneurs like these who presented today. Yes, I agree. Okay.
So with all that, friends, I'm sorry we were a little bit too late today. Next time we'll be more sharp on time. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this little session. And I really, really ask you to provide some feedback when you receive the post uh, event email. You can either drop me an email or, or answer the little survey we make, because we're going to try to make more of those explore events and, and uh, with Gabrielle and her team and others. Uh, so we need to know what's wrong and what's bad and so on. So thank you so much and mm -hmm. enjoy the rest of the day. And you know, I hope you get some honey for Christmas. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.